Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Alan Ladd and Loretta Young in And Now Tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, your guest producer, Mr. Preston Sturgis. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Around this time of year, we are all entitled to a reasonable dose of spring fever, the feeling perhaps of restlessness and vague impatience. In the old days, sulfur and molasses was the customary antidote. But tonight, we bring you a better combination in Loretta Young and Alan Ladd. They are starred in the Paramount hit, And Now Tomorrow, based on Rachel Field, Field's best-selling novel of the same name. And they assume, of course, the same roles they interpreted so finely on the screen. Loretta Young is the proud and wealthy girl who finds her romance thwarted by an act of fate, and Alan Ladd is the childhood enemy from another world who tries not only to help her overcome her handicap, but to overcome as well the barriers that stand between them. This is the second time that Alan and Loretta have been starred together on this stage, and your many letters requesting their reappearance are herewith acknowledged. Meanwhile, you may have seen Alan in his current Paramount production, Salty O'Rourke. While our story takes place before the war, the title itself, and now tomorrow, expresses our attitude throughout America today, as we turn from victory in Europe to the conquest of Japan. To the men in the services abroad, these broadcasts will continue to be sent by shortwave regularly as we receive, expressing their appreciation. Mariner writes us that while he always listened to our show on Monday nights, South Pacific, to make him full of toilet soap was. He adds, whenever I take my next shower, which may be some time from now, it will be Lux and nothing but Lux. To that exuberant seaman, many thanks. And to all his fellow men in uniform, our wishes for a safe return. It is curtain time now, and here's the first act of And Now Tomorrow, starring Alan Ladd as Merrick Vance and Loretta Young as Emily Blair. A week ago, Miss Emily Blair of Blairstown, Massachusetts, came to Chicago to see the celebrated specialist, Dr. Sloan. After days of tests and observations, he sits now in his office, watches the movements of his lips, and from them learns his discouraging verdict. What you're trying to tell me, doctor, is that there's nothing you can do for me. I'm sorry, Miss Blair. No hope at all? I'll never hear again? There's always hope. Miss Blair, two years ago in 1935, you had a severe case of meningitis. The result is marked deterioration of the auditory nerves. I know of no cure for it. I see. But I'm only one man, Miss Blair. There's Chase of Johns Hopkins, Merritt in Rochester, Caro in Montreal. I've seen them all, except Caro. I've been examined and tested by so many specialists, I... Well, I just couldn't face another one right now. I'm going home for a while. Perhaps that's best. I'm glad you haven't let your deafness be a handicap. You read lips remarkably well. I've had excellent teachers and a great deal of practice. Well, thank you, Doctor. Uh, wait a minute, Miss Blair. A doctor's obligation goes beyond mere diagnosis. Your personal life may have a bearing on what anyone can do for you. You're not married, are you? Really? What possible bearing can that have on the case? It might have a lot to do with any advice I could give you. I'd rather not discuss my affairs. As you wish. I only want to help you. Well, I, I suppose there's nothing that I shouldn't tell you. My parents died some years ago. I have a younger sister. She lives with me, and so does my aunt, who manages our factory. But no husband. I am engaged. Well, then, there's no reason why you shouldn't have a full and happy life, regardless of your hearing. Except, Doctor, I have no intention of marrying until I'm cured of deafness. I will not inflict this handicap on someone else. But that's absurd. There's nothing... Please, to... Doctor, please. I've discussed this with my fiancé. It's a matter entirely between ourselves. 
And now, if you'll tell me the amount of your... Right. Miss, your bag's in the drawing room. Are you getting on now? How soon are we leaving? For five minutes, miss. Then I believe I'll walk down the platform here. Yes, ma'am. Bangway! Bangway! Bangway, lady! Look out! What's the matter with you? Want to get yourself killed? Oh, I'm sorry, I... I didn't mean to grab you, but that baggage truck was about to run you down. I, I, I didn't hear it. You see, I'm... I'm deaf. I know. Sure you're all right? It's perfectly all right. I'm getting on that train, too. Here, let me... Thank you, thank you. I, I'm sure I'll manage nicely by... Okay. Manage nicely by yourself. Miss Blair. Yes, conductor. We'll be in Blairstown in ten minutes. Thank you. coming down to meet you. Did you say something, Mr. Mead? I said, aren't they coming down to meet you? Uh, no. No, I wanted to surprise them. Oh, your cab seems to be engaged. Huh? There's somebody in it. Uh, sorry, mister. I've got to pass you already. Oh. Oh, I see. Uh, Mr. Mead, I think I'd rather walk. If there's any walking to be done, Miss Blair, I'd like to do it. Apparently, you know my name. Yes. I'm sorry, but... Mine's Vance, Dr. Merrick Vance. Well, Dr. Vance, you've seen me embarrassed once. The baggage truck, remember? I'd rather you didn't see me embarrassed again. Meaning? That I'd feel much better if you'd share this cab with me. Just as you say, Miss Blair. Where to, mister? Dr. Weeks' house, please. Oh, you're, you're a friend of Dr. Weeks? Yes, he practically brought me up. He's our family doctor. Isn't he? Everybody's here in Blairstown. I'm sorry, Miss Blair. What for? I've been staring at you. Oh, clinical interest, Dr. Ben. <laughs> You're pretty good at reading lips. I'm sorry I shoved in on you like this. But it was your cab, Dr. Ben. Yeah, but you're Miss Blair of Blair House. One just doesn't do that for the Blair. I beg your pardon? Skip it. Dr. Weeks, please, mister. Yeah. How much do you, Skipper? Dr. Vance, please let me pay, Mr. Mead. Sorry, but even a Blair can't buy this ride. I I enjoyed it too much. Goodbye, Miss Blair. And you're home. Oh, Emily, dear, I'm so glad to see you. But, darling, why didn't you let us know? Just a surprise, Aunt Martha. Now, tell me, how is everybody? Fine. Fine. Oh. And what about you, dear? No luck. Another failure. Emily. We'll talk about it later. Where's Jeff? Still at the mill. But he'll be here for dinner. Oh, reporting to the boss, huh? Really, dear, he's done wonders at the plant. And it's all because of you. You're all he ever talks about. Emily, dear, why don't you marry him? You'd be much happier. You know why. But, darling, no, I just simply couldn't stand seeing me stare at, stare at other people's lips and watching me look around before I take a single step. Oh, we players are much too stuck up for that. Now, what about Janice? How's she? Your sister needs a talking to, my dear. She's out entirely too much and no accounting for it. But who knows? Maybe it's romance. Well, I, I better freshen up. Hurry, dear. I'll phone Jeff right away. Oh, Dr. Will's coming to dinner, too. Well, that's, that's wonderful. Oh, Jeff, don't be silly. I mean it, Janice. You shouldn't come to the office like this. Oh, darling, please don't scold me. It's this hiding, lying about working late. But, Jeff... We didn't want to fall in love. 
tried our best not to. Well, maybe we didn't try hard enough. Oh, Jeff, you haven't kissed me all day, and I... Oh, now what? Hello. Yes. Oh, Aunt Martha. What? Why, why, that's wonderful. How is she? It's Emily. She's back. Emily? She what? Oh. Well, I'll be right home. Thanks. Thanks, Aunt Martha. She wanted to surprise us. She surprised That specialist in Chicago couldn't do anything. Oh, poor Emily. But we've got to tell her, Jeff, about us. Deliberately hurt her? I simply can't do it, Janice. If only she could hear, I'd... I'd tell her... But now! All right, all right, forget it. Guess I can stand it a little while longer. You can. Come on, we better get up to the house. <laughs> sent for me, Dr. Will. Emily Blair. That's right, Merrick. Because Sloan could do nothing for her. How did you know? She sent me a wire before she left Chicago. Look, Dr. Will, I'm not for the Blairs. Sure, I've had some success with deafness, but I'm just a guy working in a free clinic. Merrick, we've known each other a long time. You're very close to me, my boy, but so are the Blairs. And just what do you want me to do? I want you to stay here for a while and treat Emily Blair. You know, I'd do anything in the world for you, Dr. Will, but this I can't see. If my work is any good, people need it who can't afford to go to the specialist. I need it far more in Pittsburgh than I am in Blairstown. Look, uh, can we talk about it later? Later? The Blairs expect me for dinner. They expect you, too. Oh, now, wait a minute. Aunt Martha insists that I bring you. Who's Aunt Martha? Martha Evans, Emily's aunt. She manages the meal. You will come, won't you? Me having dinner with the Blairs. Sure, if they won't throw me out. <laughs> Janice and Jeff and I are having coffee in the study. Dr. Vance, won't you join us? Oh, thanks. Where's Dr. Will? Same bridge, I think. We're all leaving for the Hodges dance at 10. I hope you'll come along, too. Well, don't worry about me, Miss Blair. I hope you're not too scientific to walk, Doctor. Jeff, turn up the radio. Well, I'm afraid I never had time to laugh. Oh, well, Jeff, you come on and dance then. By all means. Emily. Emily, dear. Yes? This is the tune we danced to at our engagement party. May I? I'll, I'll try, Jeff, but remember, I can't hear the music. Cigarette, doctor. No, thanks. Oh, I'm so sorry, Jeff. Stumbles. Come on. We'll start again. Oh, poor Emily. She's trying so hard not to let her deafness be a handicap. Yes, I see. Oh! Oh, I am you, Lord. My fault, darling. They're playing it faster than they used to. No, really, it's no use, Jeff. It's really no fun dancing when you can't hear the music. But, Emily, what about the Hodges party? But if you don't mind, Jeff, I don't think I'll go. My Emily... But, darling, we promised. Yes, I know. So you go ahead without me. Was, was I an escort? Of course not. Jeff will go with you. That's all right with you, isn't it, Jeff? Emily, there'll be lots of people there not dancing. I know, dear, but I'm tired. I'd, I'd really rather not go, honestly. Well, darling, we said we'd be there early, so I... I yes. Yes, you'd better leave. Emily, you sure you don't mind? Oh, of course not, darling. And have a good time. Good night, dear. Good night, Dr. Van. Good night, Mr. Stoughton. Excuse me, I'll turn off the radio. You don't like to make compromises, do you, Miss Blair? You think that's why I'm not going to the Hodges? Isn't it? <laughs> You're very observant, aren't you? That's part of my business. Besides, I know much more about you than you realize we've, uh, we've met before. We have? Yes, it was at a Christmas party at the mill. Our name wasn't Vance then, it was Bankovich. You were about seven and I was... I was twelve. You were giving out Christmas baskets for the workers. Everybody thought you were so cute. I hated you. Would you like to know why, Miss Blair? Well, no, not particularly. I'll tell you anyway. A week before Christmas, my father was let out of his job. We didn't have much to eat that winter. My father never got over it. He died a few months later. Do you blame me for hating your mill and everybody connected with it? Well, I'm sorry it happened, of course. But it wasn't my fault. No. No, it wasn't. Forget it. You've, uh, you've had a hard time, haven't you, Dr. Vance? 
Oh, not too tough. Dr. Will practically adopted me, put me through medical school. Oh, I see. That's why I'm here tonight. Oh. He wants me to try to cure you. You? Oh, I know. You never heard of me. But I've helped a lot of deaf people, Miss Blair. Dr. Vance, I have been to some of the best specialists all over the world. I know, but they don't know anything about my treatment. You see, it's something I stumbled on in a free clinic in Pittsburgh. Oh. No. So, Miss Blair, I don't think the surroundings of the clinic would suit you at all. Sure they wouldn't. And besides, I don't think I'd make a very good guinea pig. I'm not so sure of that. And since you aren't looking at me, I can say that deafness isn't the only thing I'd like to cure you I beg of, your pardon, did you say something? Uh, <laughs> I was saying, uh, I don't think I'll wait for Dr. Will. Good night, Miss Blair. Another cup of coffee, Mary? Oh, thanks, Dr. Will. By the way, you ran out on me last night. No, not on you, on Emily Blair. What happened? Nothing. Just she still thinks of me as an immigrant kid from the wrong side of the river. Now, wait a minute, Mary. Emily's a wonderful girl. Yeah, yeah, she's a tearing beauty, all right. At least she doesn't feel sorry for herself. Do you think you could do something for her? I mean, if you had time. And she wanted me to. I might. You know, I've never had a meningitis deafness. I think I'd like to try it. My boy, I'm delighted. Oh, now, wait a minute. I'd have to be in Pittsburgh at least once a week. I'd have to fly, and that costs money. Well, you leave that to me. I'll have my old office fixed into a nice little laboratory for you. We'll wear for everything you need, and I'll have Emily Blair here on Monday. All right. But remember, I'm doing this for you and you alone. I understand, my boy, perfectly. Won't you sit down, Miss Blair? Thank you. Emily didn't understand the other night how far you'd gone in your special field, Mary. I ought to have told her more about you. Well, you certainly made up for it today, Dr. Will. She's here because I believe if anyone can help her, you can. And Mary, if Emily decides to take your treatment, we'd like to keep it a little secret. But why? Well, for one thing, Dr. Vance, my aunt wants me to go to see Corot in Montreal. I don't want to. I, I want to stay home for a while. If your treatment should be successful, it would be a happy surprise for all of us. And if it isn't, well, it will save the others another disappointment. I'm very hopeful. Very hopeful. Oh, there's one thing, Miss Blair, before we go any further. If we, if we start this, I want to be sure you'll see it through. Just what does that mean? The treatments involve injections twice a week, a special serum that I've developed. How long will it last? I haven't any idea. Well, I, I mean, about how long? How long did it take with your other patients? Well, that's no indication. None of them had meningitis, and not all of them are cured. Oh. You haven't much faith yourself, have you? No. And you're not going to like the treatment. You're going to feel pretty sick after some of the injections. That's why I want your promise to stay with it until something's proved. Would you tell me at once if you knew it was useless? Well, of course. My time has a certain value, too, Miss Blair. Very well, I promise. And Dr. Will seems to have enough faith for both of us anyway. <laughs> you know, it seems as though we're both doing this for Dr. Will. You know, it's a lucky break for us that deafness isn't one of those ailments where you have to like the doctor to be helped. Or the doctor has to like his patient. Uh, yes. <laughs> you can roll up your sleeve, Miss Blair. Our stars, Loretta Young and Alan Ladd, will be back in just a moment with Act Two of And Now Tomorrow. Meanwhile, it sounds like gossip. So I said to Mary, well, that's a catty remark. You'll have to admit Ellen has a mighty adoring husband. Mary's just jealous of Ellen, that's all. That's what I think. But all I said was, well, I hope when I get a husband, he looks at me the way Jim Taylor looks at Ellen. <laughs> I guess that did it. Sounds as if Ellen were something of a glamour girl. Certainly her husband thinks she is. One thing's sure, Ellen's a girl who realizes the compelling charm of smooth, radiant skin. Yes, Ellen's a luxe girl, a girl who never takes chances with complexion loveliness. Here's her daily beauty care. My Lux Soap facials are easy and quick. I cover my face generously with the creamy active lather and work it well in. Then I rinse with warm water... 
splash on cold, and pat my face dry with a soft towel. This beauty care works for screen stars, and it works for me, too. Active lather facials with Lux Toilet Soap really do make skin softer, smoother. No wonder this fine soap is the chosen beauty soap of nine out of ten famous screen stars. Lovely women everywhere. They'll tell you the extra creamy lather is like a caress on the skin. You'll agree it feels like smoothing beauty in. Recent tests showed actually three out of four complexions improved in a short time with this gentle daily care. Why don't you get some of this fine white complexion soap tomorrow? Here's Preston Sturgis and our stars. Act two of A Now to Mow, starring Loretta Young as Emily Blair and Alan Ladd as Merrick Vance. For more than two months now, Merrick Vance has remained in Blair's town. And unknown to her family, Emily Blair comes to his improvised laboratory twice a week. Not even her fiancé, Jeff Stoughton, knows of her visit. But Jeff has other matters to keep his mind and his spare time occupied. But what do you want me to tell her, Janice? Darling, our engagement was a mistake. While you were away, I fell in love with your sister. Can't you? Then I'll tell Emily myself. I'm sick and tired of feeling like a thief just because I want something that belongs to me. You're not her property anymore. If you tell Emily one single word now, you and I are through. Jeff. Oh, Jeff, don't say such a thing. I'm sorry, darling, but I had to make you understand. Oh, Jeff, Jeff, put your arms around me. Darling, we're in your house. Someone may come in. I told you Aunt Martha went to Boston. But Emily, she... did you notice? Every Tuesday and Friday afternoon, she's gone. Wouldn't it be a laugh if she were double-crossing you? Janice. Oh, I just can't help being nasty. I, I can't stand this much longer. I can't. Engagement to Miss Blair. This is the 22nd treatment. Your arm looks sore. Does it hurt? Yes, a little. More than a little. But you're not afraid of pain, are you? Maybe you even like to suffer. I don't know what gives you the right to say that, Doctor. Why don't you marry the guy? It seems to me you won't know more about my affairs than there's any need for. Anything that affects your state of mind affects your health, and anything that affects your health is my business. <laughs> I'm your uh, doctor, remember? Very well, Doctor. Since you insist upon my saying it, you ought to know how unfair it would be for me to marry Jeff the way things are. Unfair to whom? To him, of course. Who else is there? You? Really, Doctor, I just don't want to talk about it. I'm sorry, Miss Blair. Same time, Friday. Well, Miss Blair, only a half hour late. You're improving. Last time it was 40 minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I must have walked too slowly. Oh, that's all right. Just make yourself comfortable. I'll be back in a half hour. You're going now? Yes, just sit down and read a magazine. That is, if you care to wait. You're not very polite this afternoon, are you? <laughs> about average for me, Miss Blair, about average. But, Doctor, when you say a half an hour, you mean 30 minutes, don't you? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I must have walked too slowly. <laughs> now, it's kind of you to give me lessons in manners, Dr. Vance, in addition to all of your other kindnesses to me. Oh, no one can teach you manners, Miss Blair. You know them all. <laughs> now, look... It's been over ten weeks since I've been coming to you. Do we always have to fight? It isn't fair, is it? Especially when I have all the sharp weapons. I, uh... I have an appointment with my manicurist. Otherwise, I... Well, I wouldn't have bothered to wait. You know, it's funny. You came first because of Dr. Weeks. Today you're here because you have an appointment with your manicurist. But I'm not discouraged. Someday you're going to come here just because you want to get your hearing back. Doctor... Do you think you could stop back at the house later? Frankly, Miss Blair, I doubt it. I wouldn't think of bothering you if Dr. Weeks were here, but Carrie, our cook, has a terrible cold, and Aunt Martha suggested... You can tell your Aunt Martha I'll be over after dinner. Now, if you'll step into the laboratory, we can... Look, Lou, all right, Miss Blair. Keep Carrie in bed the rest of the week and have this prescription filled right away. Thank you, Doctor. 
You're sure you won't stay a, a, a drink, perhaps? Sorry, but I Doctor, can't... There's a phone call for you. Oh, thank you, Miss Allen. You can take it on the extension there. Thank you. Hello? Hello? Yes, it's Dr. Vance. Who? Peter Gallo. Yeah. What's the matter, Peter? Little boy? Yeah. Well, what's his temperature? Uh-huh. I'll be right over. Yes, right away. Goodbye. Oh, uh, do you mind if I make a call in your taxi? If it's urgent, why don't you take one of our cars? Well, if you wouldn't mind, it's an emergency. Of course. The sedan is in the garage. Dr. Vance. Yes? Let me go with you. Why? What for? Oh, just for the ride. Please, I'm just so bored stiff this evening. <laughs> you won't find it amusing where I'm going. Shantytown. I'd still like to go. All right, get your hat and coat. How is he, Mrs. Gallup? What does the doctor say? He, he isn't sure yet. He told me to wait out here. You're Angeletta, aren't you? I'm Emily Blair. Don't you remember me? We, we went to school together. You think I don't remember you? I remember you all right. Well, if you'd rather, I'll wait outside in the car. No, it doesn't matter. Angeletta. Yes. He says, he says it's mastoid. Peter. Oh, no. I haven't any choice, Angeletta. He's too far gone to risk taking him to a hospital. I'm going to operate here. Oh, I told him, do what he thinks best. I'll need all the hot water I can get, boiling hot. I'll get it, doctor. Is there anything I can do? Yeah, it's funny. I'll have to count on you to get the anesthetic. You think you can, Miss Blair? I think I can. If you start feeling faint, be sure to tell me. Don't wait too long. No, I won't. All right, then take that red stuff off your fingernails and start scrubbing your hands. Can't you tell us? Doctor. I think you'll be all right now, Angela. I think you'll be all right. Doctor, how can I say thank you? <laughs> Forget it. He'll probably sleep now for hours. I'll be back in the morning. Be sure to take his temperature every hour. If it doesn't go down steadily, call me. Yes, doctor. Excuse me, I'll go wash up. Emily. Emily, I... want to thank you for what you did. I, I won't forget it ever. He's going to be all right. I know he is. And you let it... It seems a long time since high school days, doesn't it? I'm sorry we haven't seen more of each other. Why would we? I don't live in your world. You always had the best of everything. I think I hated you for that. Yes. I always had the best of everything. But no, I think you're wonderful. You're ready, Miss Blair. I'll take you home. Yes, Doctor, I'm ready. Do you mind if I keep the light on in the car? Light? Why? Because it's hard to see if it's dark and I can't tell if you're talking or not. You feel like talking? There's one thing I'd like to know. That little boy. What would have happened if you hadn't operated? He would have died. So quickly? Kids die like that, Miss Blair. Oh. I don't think I'll ever get over tonight. It must take great skill and courage to meet an emergency in a place like that. In Chattytown? <laughs> How'd you like it? I didn't like it. And that lovely girl just worn out, I... I hated it. You did pretty good, Miss Blair. Did you have any sensation of hearing just then? Hearing? No. No, but it's funny you're asking me that. Because at times you're so easy to talk with that I... Well, I'd almost forgotten I was deaf. You know, it's a shame you weren't born poor. Poor? Mm -hmm. It's that easy rut of prosperity you were born into and you'll be stuck in if you marry that guy you're engaged to. Now, I happen to love Jeff Stoughton, and the only kind of life I want is the kind that we'll have together, whether you approve or not. Okay, if that's what you want, I hope you get it. How about stopping for a cup of coffee? Yes, I'd like it very much, Doctor. I, uh... I have a first thing if you feel like using it. Well, that's very kind of you, but I, I don't think it would be professional. 
now that I'm your anesthetist. Okay, baby. That's another round for you. Did you say something? Huh? Oh, no, no, no. Well, you're home, Miss Blair. What time is it? About, uh, 12.30. Oh, what's Mr. Jeff Stoughton going to say about this? Why, nothing, of course. You're driving past the garage, Doctor. I'll let you out of the house. I can put the car away. Thank you. Oh, wait a minute. What? The garage, there's a light on in the upper window. Well, shouldn't there be? No. No, would you mind turning it out? Oh, not at all. Nothing wrong. There has to be some place where we can talk alone. Oh, look, he, he... Keep quiet. Jeff, he's coming up the stairs. For Pete's sake. Oh. oh. Jeff, he'll tell Emily. No, he won't tell Emily anything. Well, I hope he does. I want him to tell him. Dollar, doctors don't tell other people secrets. Everything all right, Doctor? Wait. Yes, Miss Blair. Everything's all right. Don't you ever leave this laboratory, Merrick? Hello, Dr. Will. What have you got there? The auditory nerve for the rabbit. Come on, take a look. Hmm. Looks like regenerating tissue to me. It is. Three weeks ago, I started injections of serum. The rabbit had been stone deaf. The same serum you've been using? No, something new I'm working on. But I haven't got it yet. The rabbit died. I see. You cured the disease, but killed the rabbit. Mary, what about Emily? Do I really have to go to the place for dinner? It's Thanksgiving. They're expecting you. But you haven't answered my question. You know, if there was anything to tell, I'd tell you. By the way, I have a letter from Dr. Perot in Montreal. He... She wants to know more about my serum. Hmm, that's a great compliment, Mary. Aunt Martha's set on having Emily see her own. I'm afraid we can't postpone it much longer. Uh, why don't you say what you mean, Doctor? Do I have to? No. No, I guess you don't. I know I haven't been able to help her. Then at the Blair's at 4 o'clock, you said. I'll meet you. Oh, good afternoon, Dr. Vance. Am I too early? No. No, the others are having cocktails in the house. Shall we go in? Oh, there's something I'd like to tell you first. Yes? You know, there's no place as beautiful as New England in November. And nothing suits this background more perfectly than you do. You're just the right color, just the right touch of frost. Is that what you wanted to say to me? No. It's been almost five months since we started this treatment. And you made a promise then to stay with it until something was proved. It wasn't too difficult. I... I made a promise, too. Yes. Yes, you promised to tell me if you knew the treatment wouldn't help me. Do you consider five months very long? Very long, Doctor, when you count every day of them and wait and hope. You know... You know, at first I... I didn't have any faith in you. I didn't even like you. And then after that night when you operated on the gallow child, I... What is it you're trying to tell me, Doctor? Another failure? I don't want to give up. But you have a perfect right to know the prospects aren't too bright. Oh, I guess I should have suspected it. Well, there's always Dr. Corot in Montreal. No, there isn't. Did you say something? I said no, there isn't. No, there isn't what? Dr. Corot regards the meningitis deafness as incurable. I wrote and asked him. But I could have told you a month ago that I wasn't getting anywhere. That wasn't any too honest, was it? No, not if you were sure. There's no such word as sure. I didn't tell you because, well, I just didn't want to go back to Pittsburgh. I thought you liked Pittsburgh. There's no Emily Blair there. What did you say? I said there's no Emily Blair in Pittsburgh. Oh, I see. You can't cure me, so by way of compensation, you're willing to make love to me. Who are you that a man can't make love to? You might have taste, Dr. Good something? taste, Doctor, to keep it to yourself. Well, I never learned your kind of good taste, so I can finish what I was going to say. Engaged a man named Jeff Stone, but you won't marry him. Why? Because you're deaf? Wouldn't make any difference to me. 
You think it does to him? Well, whether it does or not, he won't go on waiting forever, even though he is a Pennsylvania student. No one in my entire life has ever dared to speak to me like this, Dr. Nick. Why don't you try acting like a human being for a change? Pride isn't enough for even you to live on. Have you quite finished, Doctor? Yes. Maybe I've said it all wrong, but at least I've said it. Then perhaps we'd better go into the house. Well, here they are. Well, hello. Just in time for a drink. Cocktail, Emily? No, thank you. Doctor? Thank you. Jeff. Jeff, there's something I want to say to you. To everyone, I... I have a confession to make. A confession, dear? I'm serious, Aunt Martha. For the past five months, Dr. Vance has been trying to cure me with a special serum that he discovered. That's why I've avoided going to Montreal. Emily, at least you might have told me. I didn't want to tell anyone. And anyway, it doesn't make any difference because Dr. Vance's treatment didn't work. I'm responsible for the whole thing. Mary didn't want to do it. Emily... <laughs> That's the funniest thing I ever heard. Fancy Emily going to this handsome young doctor on the fly. Janice, behave. Please, I haven't finished. Dr. Corot can't cure me either. Dr. Vance had a letter from him. Now, apparently, no one can kill me. Jeff, I'm going to be deaf all the rest of my life. Oh, Emily, no. For the past two years, I've been indulging myself in a very selfish attitude. I've been asking you to wait and not giving you any idea of how long you'd have to wait. Well, too proud of something to see it for myself. And Jeff, if you still want it that way, I'll marry you just as soon as you like. I, I've always wanted it just that way, Emily. Oh, Jeff. I hoped you'd say that. Then we'll have our Christmas wedding after all. Even if I can't hear the wedding. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In just a minute, we'll bring you the third act of And Now Tomorrow, starring Alan Ladd and Loretta Young. And now... A dance for some homecoming soldiers. May I? Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is wonderful. Say, you were off like a dream. <laughs> I've got a good partner, soldier. No kidding. I knew you'd be like this to dance with. Light as a feather and gosh, you're mighty sweet, too. A man means many nice things when he says a girl is sweet, but this he's sure to mean. She's feminine, appealing, lovely to be near. And clever girls realize the very definite appeal of skin that's fragrant, sweet. Here's what a famous and beautiful screen star, Ann Baxter, has to say about it. There's no charm more important than perfect, exquisite daintiness. No girl should ever neglect it. And this is Ann Baxter's tip on how to make daintiness sure. A daily beauty bath with my complexion soap, Lux Toilet Soap, leaves skin really fresh and sweet. And I love the delicate fragrance a Lux Soap Bath leaves on my skin. Why not use Lux Toilet Soap as your daily bath soap, too? It's luxurious, yet very inexpensive. Each smooth white cake is hard milled. You'll find Lux Toilet Soap doesn't get mushy or soft can be used to the last thin sliver. Get some of this fragrant white beauty soap tomorrow. Here's Preston Sturgis, our guest producer. After this final act, our stars have an important message for you. Now our curtain rises on the third act of And Now Tomorrow, starring Alan Ladd as Merrick Vance and Loretta Young as Emily Blair. <laughs> Two days before Emily's wedding to Jeff Stoughton, in the home of Dr. Weeks, 
Merrick Vance is getting ready to return to Pittsburgh. He has hurried to completion the last experiment with his new serum. Excitedly, he's called for Dr. Weeks to see the results. All right, Dr. Will, hit the tuning fork and watch the rabbit. He jumped. Sure he jumped. It's scaring. Last week, his rabbit was dead. He's had five shots, very small ones, but he's, but he's cured. Merrick, a complete cure? Yeah, but on a rabbit. I'll have to go back to Pittsburgh to really test it. And it'll have to be on human beings, volunteers. When are you leaving? Tomorrow. Then I'll see you after I get back from the rehearsal. Rehearsal? Yes. At the church. I'm to give the bride away. Oh. I'll be sure to give her my congratulations. <laughs> Thanks for the lift home, Dr. Will. Tell me, how did rehearsal really go? Was the music right? My dear, everything was perfect. Doctor, hmm? did you notice Janice? She seemed, uh, well, upset. I think moved would be the better word. By the way, where is she? She and Jeff should be along any minute. Now, what's the mystery? You said you wanted to see me alone. Yes. It's about Merrick Vance. He's developed a new serum. He's been treating a rabbit death from birth. Yes? Good day, it could hear. Merrick's going back to Pittsburgh tomorrow. More tests and then experiments on human patients. That'll take a long time, won't it? A long time. Can't fool around with serums, you know. No, no, of course not. Now you run along to bed. Good night, Emily. Good night, Dr. Will. <laughs> I know it's late, but I've got to speak to you. Well, sure. Come on in. Dr. Will told me tonight about your new cure. Sure? I have no cure. A rabbit isn't a human being. Oh, no, of course not, but it might mean that a human being could be cured, too. I don't know that. There's still lots of work to be done, finding out if what will work on a rabbit will work on people. What people? Volunteers, charity patients back in Pittsburgh. You don't have to go to Pittsburgh, Dr. Vance. I want to volunteer. And the answer is no. Oh, I don't see why. Those people at the clinic, are they any better for your purpose? Do they want the hearing back more than I do? Now, look, Miss Blair, I've tried to tell you that I... I know, I know that you have to test the serum. Well, then test it on me. Oh, look, Dr. Vance. Do you remember that first night you came to our house? I told you I didn't think I'd make a very good guinea pig. Well, I was wrong. I'd make a fine guinea pig. Emily Blair... No better than a charity patient? <laughs> you have changed, haven't you? Oh, what does it matter? Well, it matters to me because I've changed, too. I can't experiment on you any longer. I tried to tell you that Thanksgiving day, but you shut me up. You did something else that day, Dr. Van. You took away my hope. And with no hope of hearing, I committed myself to marrying Jeff as I am. Incomplete. Well, you love him, don't you? Isn't that enough? It needn't be. When Dr. Will told me what you've been doing... That hope was reborn again. I know now that I can't live without it. Well, you can and you will. I'm not going to let you hope again. But you can't stop working. I'll be hoping. You won't give up, will you? Will you? No, I guess not. As long as you're deaf, I'll go on working. Until I can give you the only thing you want from me. Oh, don't make me wait till then. Start now. Now? Yes. You know, don't you, that it's... Mean I might die. No, it may easily fail again. I'm not afraid. Oh, Jeff has waited for me now for a little longer. You want to take a second to prepare the shot? Sit down, will you? The immediate injection will feel like the others almost at once. That's better. Sit down. Oh, hello, Dr. Will. And, sir, continuing. That's right, the van stop. A good doctor is never for his patient, is he, Mary? That's right. And you choose. You choose to. I insisted that he give it. It's untested. It's dangerous. Emily's been. You see, I'm talking a language that neither of you want to understand. I'm taking you home, Emily. I... Emily. Emily, are you. What's the matter? Uh, I. Dr. Will. You fool. Help me get her to the couch, then get my car. <laughs> Dr. Will. Pulse is regular. She's 
still unconscious. Please, she's going to live. Yes, she'll live. No thanks to you. Well, I can leave now. But I had to. Yes, of course. What time is it? Ten past seven. Just time for you to make the eight o'clock train. Just. Dr. Well. Dr. Well. You're home in bed, Emily. You're all right. Everything's all right. Dr. Van? He's not here. He'll come soon. He's on the train to Pittsburgh, my dear. He went away? Not until he knew you were all right. I do. What, what happened to him? To the injection. It produced a sort of uh, shock. You had us worried. But why? Why did he go away? We'll talk about it later. Try to rest. <laughs> Is it? Oh, good morning, Miss Blair. It's eight o'clock. I was about to get you some breakfast. And then Dr. Weeks wants to see you. He's so gloomy in here. I'll pull the drape. Won't matter much, though. A real nasty day. Rained all night, and now it's turned to sleep. Fine day to be sick. Well, I started a fire in the fireplace. That should cheer you up. Anything you want before I bring your tray? No. No, thank you. I'll be back in a few minutes. She should know it was. Oh, no, no, no. I want to tell her myself. Where's Jeff? Oh, he'll be here soon, dear. Oh, I want to see Jeff's face. Oh, Dr. Will. Dr. Vance. Oh, I wish he'd waited. So do I, my dear. He should have been the first to know. Oh, no, darling. Jeff should be the first. You don't know what this is going to mean to him. Almost as much as it means to you. And to me, darling, to me. Hello, Janice. How's Emily? She's waiting for you, Jeff. In her room? Yes, I'll go on up with you. How is she, Janice? She's fine. Never better. What? She's better than she's been for years. Look. That's so. We won't have to postpone the wedding. Are you really going through with it, Jeff? Of course I am. What else can I do? A man of honor, aren't you? Keep your promise. That's the way things are. You'll have to accept them just as I have. I see. She's dead, so you can't let her die. That's the way I feel. Here's the door. We might as well go in. 
Jeff, before we go in, I... I want to be sure of one thing. Yes, Janice? You do love me, don't you, Jeff? Janice, please. You aren't afraid that she can hear you, are you? After all, she can only hear you when she's looking at you. Yes, of course. Then but... say it. Do you love me? You know I do, Janice. Thanks, Jeff. You'd better go in now. Emily has something to say to you. Aren't you coming in? I... I think now she'd rather see you alone. Janice, please. Come in. Hello, Emily. You're looking wonderful. Oh, so you love Janice. What do you mean? I think it's simple enough. I heard you. You heard me? Yes. You can hear? She can hear, Jeff. There's no reason now why you shouldn't tell her. Yes, I think you'd better tell me, Jeff. Emily, I... I'd rather do anything than hurt you. Even marry me? Emily. Now, look, Jeff. Will it help you if I tell you I'm not going to ask you to choose between Janice and me? I have no apologies, Emily. You were away a great deal, and we fell in love with each other. Janice, what about you? Do you love Jeff? Yes, Emily. I love him. Oh, I see. I... Janice, sit down. Jeff, you sit down, too, both of you. Oh, poor Jeff. You haven't been happy, have you, you and Janice? No, we haven't. Meeting out in country roads and cars over the garage. Over the garage? Yes, it was the only place we could talk alone. Why, that's strange. One night I came home with Dr. Vance and I saw a light in the window... He went upstairs to turn it out. We were there. Janice and I. He saw us. He saw you. Yes. Well, that's funny. He, he didn't even mention it. And then on the terrace on Thanksgiving Day, he practically challenged me to marry you, Jeff. I wonder why he thought that was such a good idea. I, I think I'll have to ask him the next time I see him. <laughs> Just a minute, please. Pittsburgh Emergency. Yes, he's right here. Who? Just a minute, please. Oh, Dr. Vance. Yes? There's a call for you. You can take it there at the desk. Oh, yes, thanks. Hello. This is Miss Blair, Dr. Vance. Oh, hello, Miss Blair. How are you? Just fine, thanks. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I I suppose today's the day for good wishes. Oh, no more so than any other day. Well, you are being married, aren't you? Not that I know of. And by the way, Dr. Vance, you have a lovely voice. You see, this is the first time I've heard it. Hey. Hey, hey. You can hear. You're telephoning. The serum, it, it worked. You can hear. Hey, hey. Hello, hello. Hello, operator, operator. So, so somebody cut me off. Cut you off? Yeah, yeah, I was talking to Massachusetts. Good morning, there was a... Vance. Good morning. Miss Blair. Uh, uh, Emily. You phoned from here. I was talking to you in the house phone just across the hall. Hey, hey, hey. Quick, quick into my office right this way. <laughs> you, you can hear. Yes. It worked. Yes, it worked. Come here. What? Did I hear you say you weren't getting married? No, I'm not, thanks to you. Thanks to me? Well, in the first place, thanks to you, I, I have my hearing back. But more than that, my eyes are open, too. Oh, 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 you mean about Stoughton and your sister? Well, yes, yes, that, but more... That's why I came to Pittsburgh. To start repaying you. Uh, repaying me for what? Oh, I don't mean in money. But once you said you wished I had been born poor, well, I find myself wishing that, too, because now I know what you meant. I would have been useful. I would have learned how to work. Perhaps I began being useful when I started being a guinea pig. And perhaps now I can continue by being an exhibit for you. Until you help me to learn other useful things. There was something else I said to you, remember? What? I, I said there was no Emily Blair in Pittsburgh. Well, there is now. To stay? Yes. What about Blair's town and all you left there? Oh, that was yesterday, darling. And now tomorrow. Well, 
round of applause for tonight's stars, Loretta Young and Alan Ladd, who come to the footlights to receive our thanks. Oh, and thank you, Preston. It was a pleasure to be back here again with Alan and to work with such a fine cast. I'd better warn you both that the autograph hounds are lined up at our stage door. Oh. <laughs> well, Preston, we, we've been collecting autographs ourselves these last few days. You and Loretta mm -hmm. collecting autographs? What kind? Well, the kind that make you feel humble when you read their names. Will Rogers, for example. Wallace Reed. And Carol Lombard. Well, where do you pick up photographs like this? Oh, a few blocks from here. At a booth outside of Paramount Studios. They cut the signatures off canceled paychecks that the studios saved from years back. And you can take your pick with every war bond that you buy. Well, that's one way of adding attraction to the best investment in the world. Well, that's right, Preston. But you don't really need premiums to urge you to buy war bonds. Where can you do better than four bucks for three? <laughs> I can understand why you two have a personal interest in this seventh war loan. Alan having served in uniform and you, Loretta, with a husband in the army. Oh, I don't think Alan and I have any more vital interest in this drive than every other American president. Yes, it's just hard sometimes to think for any one individual to realize what his purchase means. Right, Alan. So let's look at it this way. If everyone in our Lux audience, for instance, bought just one $25 bond, it would come to a total of three quarters of a billion dollars. And that's a lot of hay in any language. Especially in Japanese. Right. And if our audience were to buy a hundred dollar bond apiece, we'd have a fighting total of three billion good American dollars, enough to build 40 aircraft carriers and send them against the Japs with 4,000 planes aboard. That's quite a challenge to your audience, Preston. I hope they'll have acted on it before we meet again next week. What play do you have for next week, Press? Next Monday night, we take you to the bluegrass country with a story of romance and racing from the 20th century Fox success, Kentucky. And our stars are Lorraine Day, Walter Brennan, and Tom Drake. A family feud that clashes with a warm and moving love. And the color and excitement of the racetrack give you one of the screen's most powerful and gripping dramas. Well, we'll be looking forward to it, Preston. And good night. Good night. Good night, and thanks to all of us. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Lorraine Day, Walter Brennan, and Tom Drake in Kentucky. This is Preston Sturgis saying good night from Hollywood. Buy a poppy and wear it as a tribute to the men who sacrificed for you in this war and the last. The money you give goes to help disabled veterans and their families. Buying a poppy is the best way of saying thank you. And Now Tomorrow was presented through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, whose current picture is the Hal Wallace production of The Affairs of Susan, starring Joan Fontaine and George Brent. Loretta Young will soon be seen in the international picture, Along Came Jones. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Kentucky with Lorraine Day, Walter Brennan, and Tom Drake. Short on points, short on sugar, then don't risk precious ingredients. Switch to the spry way, the sure way to baking and frying success. Get light, velvet-rich cakes, Tender, flaky pastry, golden, digestible fried foods with Spry. That's pure all-vegetable shortening at its creamy best. S-P-R-Y, Spry. Be sure to listen in next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Kentucky with Lorraine Day, Walter Brennan, and Tom Drake. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>